Um, our first uh, uh, breakout session will be the uh, in product uh, improvement committees uh, a session called um, advancement in uh, in product. Um, and that, uh, that committee is actually chaired by uh, to Dr. Tommy Perkins. Um, uh, Dr. Perkins has been engaged uh, in BI Act BIF activities for a long time, uh, currently serves as associate professor um, and the Dean Hawkins chair for CalCAF management um, at West Texas A&M. And so we're delighted to have uh, uh, Tommy on board and uh, to chair the, uh, the session today. And uh, I'll give him uh, remote control here. And uh, Tommy will take care of uh, the introductions and legwork uh, on the committee session. And Tommy, welcome. Sounds like uh, everything's working well and uh, we should be uh, good to go. So the bus is yours, man. Thank you, Dr. Weber. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Welcome from uh, Canyon, Texas, where the wind never seems to quit blowing. So I wish you guys were here today. Uh, I want to start off by congratulating Dr. Bob Weber and his entire team. What a great job you guys have done to, to make this thing happen in the virtual environment. It's been a, a great event uh, through the first two days anyway, so we'll try to make this third one a, a better day as well. Uh, you're really lucky to have three outstanding presentations today in our session. I appreciate each and every one of you being here to to be a part of this because it's going to be a, a good uh, next six hours, hopefully. All right, so we're going to start today with uh, uh, the first presentation. Um, Dr. Mike McNeil uh, received his uh, PhD from South Dakota State University in 1982. Uh, he worked for the USDA Agriculture Research Service from 1980 through 2011. Um, he was at first at US Mark, and then he went to, for about the next 22 years at the Fort Keogh Livestock Range Research Laboratory at Mile City, Montana. Uh, as a researcher, he is primarily focused on finding genetic solutions uh, to applied problems that compromise efficient beef production, enhancing systems of national cattle evaluation, using genomics uh, technology to discover quantitative trait loci, as well as to assess genetic diversity in various species. He provides statistical consulting to researchers in many disciplines and works internationally using animal breeding tools to alleviate hunger and poverty. And he also spent a little time with the Ultrasound Guidelines Council, and we really appreciate the previous service there, and we look forward to having Dr. Mike McNeil uh, present some latest research on, on ultrasound world. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Well, thank, okay. well, thank you, Tommy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's kind of a foreign experience because I don't know if anybody can hear me or not. You sound great. We can. You sound great, McNeil. Okay. As, as I start, I need to acknowledge the contributions of Brady Schmidt, who was a graduate student who did a, a lot of heavy lifting on a, a project for the Ultrasound Guidelines Council, and Michael Gonda, who was her major professor at South Dakota State. I'm also appreciative of an adjunct appointment at SDSU and the support I received from the Agricultural Research Council in South Africa. In today's presentation, we will take a deeper dive into the variation that exists in carcass traits that are measured using ultrasound. Okay, and I do not seem to have control of the screen, Bob. Okay, it looks like you're good to go, McDowell. Okay, thanks. So, ultrasound technology developed since the 1950s is implemented in a straightforward way for the non-invasive measurement of carcass traits on candidates for selection. This technology allows us to have many, many more observations of carcass phenotypes on the animals that are most relevant than would be possible without it. It's really hard on candidates for selection when you slaughter them to measure carcasses. Incorporation of these data into national cattle evaluation is both straightforward and widespread. So. 
the car just as a refresher the measurement of carcass traits with ultrasound involves really um, taking scanned images at three locations on the animal. The first location is parallel to the backbone and is used to used to measure intramuscular fat or IMF. The second measurement is parallel with the ribs at location two on this slide and is used to measure both intramuscular fat or used to measure back fat and ribeye area. The third measurement used by some breed associations is rump fat and it's indicated at the scan location three. In the lower right corner of this slide, you can see the measurements of back fat depth and ribeye area. If I advance that, you can see then the, the ultrasound image that results in the measurement of IMF taken in the longismus muscle over top of the of the ribs. Let's see if I can in in a box that would be in the area here by my cursor. So let's let's talk a little bit about the flow of the ultrasound data um, as it's collected. First, a, a technician comes to your farm or ranch and, and actually scans the cattle. Then that that data or that images are transferred to a a UGC accredited laboratory that it does the image interpretation. So they're responsible for converting the, the visual image into data. That data is transferred to a breed association or genetics evaluation service provider who then transforms the data into EPDs. We certainly hope that those EPDs all get used in in the genetic selection process that results in a new calf crop being produced. And those calves again scanned by a UGC certified technician to produce a new set of data. And that cycle goes on um, in perpetuity. So it, over the past, we have given lots of attention to the incorporation of data into genetic evaluation systems. But we've really paid far less attention to the underlying assumptions that are involved in that. I think all of us would like to believe that the effects of which technician and which interpretive laboratory are involved in the collection of ultrasound data are relatively small due to UGC certification. And the breed associations would like to believe that the evaluations they produce are, are not biased by home heterogeneity of variants because of their assumptions of the homogeneity of those variances, both additive genetic and, and residual. So in this research, we set out to test some of those assumptions. The homogeneity within technician variants. So do all technicians scan cattle, produce data from scanned cattle that have similar sorts of ranges? And then are the technician effects actually ascent, are the technician effects essentially nil? Are the home are the genetic and residual variances across imaging laboratories truly homogeneous? Do the results from those data coming from different imaging laboratories lead us to measurement of the same trait? Or said differently, is the genetic correlation between those treated as different traits truly one? 
Another informal way to state those hypotheses might be to ask the question, does it matter who scans the cattle or which lab interprets the data? The data used in this study came from the American Hereford Association, the American Angus Association, and the American Simmental Association. It was collected in the period between 1915 or 19, 2015 and 2017. All of this data was previously incorporated into the relevant national cattle evaluations. And in the data today, we're going to be concerned with longissimus muscle area, intramuscular fat, and subcutaneous fat depth. And this data set is, then has associated with it the animal ID. The contemporary group is identified by the breed association. So we didn't reformulate those. We simply took whatever the breed association said was the contemporary group and used that. The technician identification, which includes the technology that technician used in scanning the cattle, and the imaging laboratory that interpreted the data. So all of these data have come through at least two quality control processes. The quality control of the imaging, imaging laboratory that says that the image was of satisfactory quality and the breed association quality control process that says the data was of satisfactory quality. So to briefly describe the data, I've got three slides that look very much like this um, with the imaging laboratories identified simply one, two, and three. Um, the traits, logismus muscle area, subcutaneous fat depth and IMF. Um, we're using the terminology subcutaneous fat depth because Angus combines the measure of rump fat and rib fat into a single measure um, for analysis. And that is the measure that we got from them. You can see that for in these data, there's a sizable number of technicians, an even more sizable number of contemporary groups, and quite a few animals. In the Angus data, there's 93 technicians scanning cattle in over 5,000 contemporary groups, and the total number of records is just under 66,000 records. You can see in the, in the last column of this slide that the phenotypic standard deviations of those data, and those phenotypic standard deviations, as illustrated here by the ribeye areas, might give you some pause as to whether or not the range of data coming out of those image interpretation laboratories is actually the same or not. This is the summary of the data from Hereford with the same sort of organization um, on the slide. The Hereford data set's a little smaller. There's 66 technicians involved here. There's 4,500 plus contemporary groups of cattle and overall 43,000 plus records. And again, the, there's a little bit of variation in, in the traits, phenotypic variation in the traits coming out of different labs. Simmental data, exactly the same organization with, in this case, 87 different technicians scanning the cattle. 40, 4,400 plus different contemporary groups. 
48,000, north of 48,000 records. And, and again, some variation in phenotypes depending on the interpretive lab. It's this phenotypic variation. Oh man, I gotta be careful with my fingers. It's this phenotypic variation that we're gonna try to tease apart in the subsequent analysis. Okay, now we gotta get the, I have to be really careful with my fingers. The statistical model that we used is a little different than what's done in national cattle evaluation. So we have a phenotype for a, any one of the carcass traits, and that's abbreviated as Y. There's some overall mean for that phenotype. We're going to actually identify in the model the specific technician who scanned the cattle to produce those data. The contemporary group within technician, because if Tommy Perkins is scanning the cattle, he's the only person that scans that contemporary group. But Tommy scans hopefully more than one contemporary group in a year. And then we have an additive genetic effect for the individual animals. And we have the, the remaining variation that's not explained by those terms that are included in the model. All of my, all of this analysis was done using the MTDF or ML software and all effects in the model were considered random with the exception of the overall mean. In, a, in the classical national cattle evaluation, the technician effect would be confounded with the contemporary group and that contemporary group effect would be considered fixed. In some of the analysis, we, we switch modes to a multi-trait model where the Ys here subscripted one, two, and three are the measurements that come from the individual interpretive labs. The, the usual assumptions about the technician effects associated with the labs um, being independent of each other are made. Those, that assumption may be open to some question because of some of the technicians submit data to more than one interpretive lab and there may be some correlation there that wouldn't be accounted for in this analysis. We're going to assume the contemporary group effects are likewise independent. Um, that too may not be quite right because contemporary groups on the same farm or ranch might be correlated. But that's no different than the assumptions that are made today in national cattle evaluation. Likewise, the errors are assumed independent, consistent with the assumption of the national cattle evaluation. And the animal effects, the additive genetic effects are assumed to be correlated with each other through the relationships among animals. The other, the one thing that is different than the typical MTDF Remel analysis is that we use the Vigima and Bastien approximation of standard errors for genetic correlations. That's because no animal in the data is interpreted by more than one lab. So on to the results. And I'll apologize in advance. Some of these slides are pretty data dense or messy. And I'll try to highlight certain aspects of that rather than reiterate every number on every slide. First, to give you some level of comfort with the data. We estimated heritability in a, in a way that's consistent with most of the literature and with the way that you would see it reported in most of the national cattle evaluations. And that's assuming that the phenotypic variance 
is the sum of the additive genetic variance and the residual variance. That is, assuming that these are the only random effects in phenotypic variance. And you can see on this slide estimates of heritability that very much are consistent with what we think those estimates are based on, on the literature. Now, as we dive deeper into this, we're going to change the definition of phenotypic variance to include contemporary group effects and technician effects. So on this slide, and I'll, I'll highlight this column, this column would have an interpretation of being heritability. It's the proportion of additive genetic variance that is in the phenotypic variance but the phenotypic variance here is redefined. And we're going to talk about then the homogeneity of additive genetic variance and the homogeneity of the, of the residual variance as, as it affects these traits. And I need to pause here just briefly because I have to have another slide. So the, the next three slides are all similar to this. The, the, next, the next three slides are all similar to the one you're seeing here. Um, there's going to be one slide for each of the one slide for each of the traits. And in general, on the on the slide here for legismus muscle area. The additive genetic variances appear to be homogeneous, but I call your attention to the to the data here on, on the Hereford and ask the question, is the difference between labs two and three here in additive genetic variance big enough to care about? And likewise, is the 50% increase in residual variance in the Angus data big enough to care about? I don't, I don't truly know the answer to that question in a definitive sense, but, but this certainly says that the labs spread out the breeding values more so, lab two spreads out the breeding values more so than does lab three. And so if I had a bull that I really wanted to float to the top, I'd be sure to get him evaluated through lab two. For ribeye area, the technician who scans the cattle influences the data almost as much as do additive genetic effects. And I might be concerned about that degree of variation among technicians. So if we move over to fat depth, those results are shown on this slide. And I give you just a, a second to digest those. Again, the, the contemporary group variances are large and we expect that. That's got all the variation from ranch to ranch and feeding program to feeding program and uh, gender of the cattle and so on, all rolled into one wad. And, and so the fact that those variances explain a lot of the variation is not unexpected. With, with just one exception, the technicians scanning the cattle contribute significantly as a source of variation in the measurements. The, the proportion of variance in fat depth that's not explained by the model is greater than it was for longismus muscle area. That's maybe just an artifact of the trait. Again, the additive genetic variances appear to be generally homogeneous. 
But the difference in additive genetic variants between labs one and one and labs two and three in the Simmental data is fairly large. And likewise, the residual variances appear to be generally homogeneous, but the difference between labs one and three in Simmental data also might be large enough that we should be concerned. Okay, so this is intermuscular fat. Um, for, for many of us, we've paid a lot more attention to intermuscular fat than the other two traits. I, not, I think that has to do with we emphasis on quality grade when we market cattle. Again, the technician who scans the cattle and with what technology explains a significant amount of variation in this trait. And I would reiterate that, you know, certainly the Ultrasound Guidelines Council pays a lot of attention to the certification of technicians and particularly with this trait. In the Angus data, lab two appears to produce more additive genetic variants than either labs one or three. But in Hereford and Simmental, the patterns that we see are, are quite different. In the Hereford and Simmental data, all the variance component estimates coming from lab two are relatively small. Whereas the variance component estimates coming from lab three are quite large. So those two labs really define the range of the data. Okay. So now the next three slides, we're gonna show the genetic correlations and the rank correlations for sires. And I, and I wanna point out the genetic correlations have the expectation of one. That is, we expect that the trait that's measured by one lab is the same, genetically the same trait as is measured by another lab or produced by another lab. And the Angus data here for intermuscular fat typify that expectation. Those estimates are, those estimates certainly make me pretty happy to see that kind of a result. And I go to the bottom of the screen and I highlight this estimate of 0.78. And that estimate's clearly not one statistically, but it's still quite large. But that gives me a little pause for, for concern. Then if I, if I switch kind of focus to these, to the rank correlations, which are in this triangle, for the sires that were had progeny evaluated by more than one lab, those sires ranked almost identically in the Angus data. So we feel pretty good about that. They ranked again, almost identically in the Hereford data and nearly as well in the, in the Simmental data. We, we can't tell you how well individual animals ranked because no, no lab actually evaluates the scans from the same animal. No two labs actually evaluate the scans from the same animal. We look at subcutaneous fat depth. Again, the Angus data, the genetic correlations are quite large. This one slips a bit, but it's not, not bad. The rank correlations in the Angus data are very satisfying for the sires. The Simmental data at the bottom of the slide slips a bit relative to the Angus data and, and we're a little concern maybe that they're not exactly the same trait. But the Hereford data really causes us to, to pause and scratch our heads and say, what's going on here? 
these data suggest to us that the interpretation by the different labs is really producing measurements that are, are not leading us to say that, that back fat in these data is the same trait. This, this needs some further exploration. These genetic correlations being smaller leads us to rank correlations among sires that are also smaller. Intermuscular fat, again, correlations for the Angus data are pretty good. The rank correlations of sires are Sires in the Angus data aren't changing rank very much. That's, you know, that's, those rank correlations are somebody in that list of 500 sires is, is moving 10 positions or something. It's, it's not a very big move at all. The correlations in the Hereford data are, are a little lower. They certainly are, are less than one, but they're still in a range that customarily as, as animal breeders, we would say these are, are not bad relative to the expectation of one. And the rank correlations of sires are, are fairly satisfying. The Simmental data is um, pretty much similar to the Herford data with the the rank, the genetic correlations being statistically different than one, but the rank correlations fairly satisfying for those sets of sires. So, in summary, um, what what do I see? I see considerable variation among technicians. In for many traits, for all three traits, it's as large or larger than the additive genetic variance. And there's there's only a few exceptions um, with a few of the interpretive labs to that general statement. I, I didn't put up the data dense slide that would show you the individual estimates of within technician variance um, with 50 or more data points on that slide, it would be unlegible. But for all traits, the within technician estimates of variance are heterogeneous. That is, the technicians don't spread the cattle out to the same degree. And, and that might give us a bit of concern. If we, if we switch our attention to additive genetic variants, those, those traits are generally spread out on the additive, the EPDs would generally be spread out on the additive genetic scale um, to roughly the same degree by the interpretive labs, but there may be a few exceptions in that. Likewise, with some exception, the estimates of residual variants are generally homozygous among the labs. The genetic correlations among the interpretive laboratories suggest that the labs may be reporting slightly different traits, not greatly different, but slightly different traits. Um, and, and there's a particular situation with the Hereford data for subcutaneous fat that, that really gives us some pause. Uh, we might ask, what is it about the Hereford data that's different? Is it something to do with the biology of Hereford cattle? Hereford cattle are known to have heavier hides. Um, is, is there something in that hide measure, in that hide um, that we're scanning through that's compromising the measurement, or is that an anomaly in the data? And, and at this point, I can't answer that question for you. So we're gonna make a few recommendations. 
it's it's our judgment based on these data that UGC probably needs to revisit the certification standards. Um, if if we subscribe to the thought that it doesn't matter who scans the cattle or which lab interprets the data, then those measurements shouldn't be spread out depending on which technician or lab does it. And, and some tightening up of that quality control on the part of UGC um, is valuable. There may be some merit in standardizing the methods of image interpretation that can be deployed across laboratories. Right now, each lab has its own methodology that they're comfortable with and they use. But maybe for the industry, we'd do a better job if everybody used one method. And, and then finally, I think the breed associations need to do a deeper dive into their data analysis um, based on the assumptions that they make when they calculate the EPDs rather than just making them. So some closing thoughts. There's some work to do to make ultrasound data the most valuable tool it can be for the genetic improvement of beef cattle. Make no mistake about it. I believe the data collected by ultrasound are of unquestioned value in, these, in the genetic improvement. Without it, we don't get measures of carcass traits directly on the candidates for selection. And without it, we have much, much smaller data sets upon which to base the EPDs for carcass traits. And the rank correlations for sires, at least, are generally in excellent agreement across those interpretive labs. I need to, I need to acknowledge the UGC both for, for funding some of this work we're certainly appreciative of that, particularly Brady, whose graduate assistantship was paid by, in part by UGC, but also for being willing to allow a third party to take a deeper dive through the data to, to point out some ways in which we might do better than we're doing today and to disclose that information publicly. All too often, that doesn't happen. I want to also recognize the South Dakota Beef Checkoff, the Beef Industry Council for the willingness to match the funding of UGC and the South Dakota Agricultural Experiment Station for again matching the funding of our industry partners. Obviously without the support of the American Angus Association, the American Herford Association, and the American Simmental Association, we wouldn't have any data to do this work with, and we thank them for that. So thank you, and, and at this point, I'll take any questions. I, Tommy, I see there's three in the chat room, and I can probably deal with those. Okay. And there's two more on the Q&A. And somebody says I should turn off my pointer. Yeah, based on the essence of time, we may only have time for a couple of those questions and we can get back to those. Uh, okay. We'll on back, but try to catch a couple of those, please. Okay. Um, so the first question from Donna Berry in, in Ireland. Do you know if there's a difference in age, gender of the animals? by technician or lab. Um, and I'm not going to read the rest of your question, Donna. Uh, the technicians, for the most part, scan multiple contemporary groups. 
the, the contemporary groups, part of the contemporary group definition would certainly include gender and age effects or an age slice. So that would get taken up there, but the technicians would scan enough contemporary groups of cattle in these data that that would be a, a contributing factor to the technician variance um, to any large degree. And from, from Razi to, and I don't know where Razi's from. I, I have a guess, but I'm not certain. Why do the Angus results show typically better correlations than the other two breeds? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll hazard a guess. My guess is one, the Angus is the biggest segment of the population of cattle that these data come from. And because of that, or in part because of that, more of the training of technicians and of the algorithms used to interpret images may be done on Angus cattle than on cattle from other breeds. That may in fact play some into that Hereford back fat situation that's a bit troubling. Tommy, you need to tell me when to be quiet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bengal. I'm going to stop there. I've taken uh, screenshots. I've got the other questions that were asked, and we'll have to get back with them. We'll email those back just to, on the essence of time. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Mc, McNeil, can you see the, the Q&A box? I can. Um, you can answer those. Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind, just stay on. You can type some of those out and respond to those individually. Oh, I'll put them in there, and it'll go out to the group so everybody can get, get those. And, okay. Um, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Great presentation. We appreciate it. Our next speaker, uh, again, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Allison Van Enenem. She's Corporate Extension Specialist in the field of animal genomics and biotechnology in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis. She received a Bachelor's of Agricultural Science from the University of Melbourne in Australia and has both an MS in animal science and a PhD in genetics from UC Davis. Her publicly funded research and outreach program focuses on the use of animal genomics and biotechnology in livestock production systems. Her current research projects include the development of genome editing approaches for cattle, and you've seen her in the media a lot uh, in recent years. She serves as the bovine genome coordinator for the USDA National Animal Genome Research Program and is elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science. She has given over 650 invited presentations to audiences globally and uses a variety of media to inform general public audiences about science and technology. As a passionate advocate of science, Dr. Ben Inanen was a recipient of the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology in 2014. Uh, Borlaug, uh, she's also a Borlaug Communications Award, uh, 2016 the Beef Improvement Federation Continuing Service Award, and uh, lastly, the American Society of Animal Science 2019 Rockefeller Apprentice Award in Animal Breeding and Genetics. What an honor it is to have uh, Allison on with us today. Again, thanks to participants being here. Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Tommy. Um, I think I have a, a, a recording of my presentation, and then I'll take questions at the end. Very good. Um, Hello, this is Alison Van Enenem speaking to you from the Beef Improvement Federation End Product uh, Improvement Session. And my topic is, are alternative meats an end product improvement? Um, and I guess to me, I need to know what that means. Does it mean you've got better product attributes, better taste, better price, better nutritional attributes, better sustainability metrics? Um, and so I'm going to look into the evidence base to kind of ask these questions of these uh, alternative meats. First, I'm going to go over what an alternative meat is for those of you that are, are not uh, familiar with this area. So the first kind of 
product line, if you will, is vegan meat substitutes. Um, so they used to be called veggie burgers, but um, basically you're using plant-based um, concentrates and proteins, often from legumes, um, that are then broken down and added to binders and fats and flavors to give them a meat-like taste. And then very importantly, nutrients are added to at least meet the amount of nutrients in meat for things like B12 and iron and the like. Um, and then these um, nutrients are often produced in su using cellular agriculture to, to bring in things like proteins and, and other compounds that are synthesized in recombinant yeast and microbes, then purified and you can add things like vitamin B12, which are harvested and then added to this final product. And for example, the Impossible Burger adds um, soy leg hemoglobin in, um, to add iron to their final patty or, or hamburger and these products are typified by things like the Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger or Just which is a, a plant-based mayonnaise and they're quite distinct um, from in vitro or cultured or cell-based meat where you're there going in and taking a biopsy from a cow or a pig or a chicken or a fish whatever it is and you take this stem cell and you basically multiply it through exponential growth uh, in a bioreactor. And a bioreactor is basically heated to 37 degrees and they're fed with a medium containing amino acids and salts and sugars to really rapidly grow these cells in culture. And, and this bioreactor basically replaces, if you will, the body of a cow. Um, so it's responsible for providing nutrients, removing waste, keeping it um, safe from um, diseases and microbial contamination and then at the end you change the culture conditions to push the cells to differentiate into muscle and fat and connective tissue and put that all together and you end up with a, a cultured meat product. And it's, there's a lot of venture capital buzz around this topic. So according to an A.T. Kearney report, um, these novel vegan meat replacements and cultured meat have the potential to disrupt the meat industry. And they predict um, that by 40%, uh, by 2040, 40% of global meat consumption will still come from conventional meat sources. That's 20 years time. <laughs> um, and that's really um, driven a lot of venture capital. And so this same report says there's been about $50 million in global funding for the cultured meat um, companies and about $900 million for the uh, vegan meat replacement brands with things like um, Just and, and um, Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger. And who's investing? Well, interestingly, there's some familiar faces here, um, perhaps very familiar as of recent days. Um, but there's a lot of um, celebrity buzz, uh, not only very wealthy venture capitalists, um, and ironically, even some that own airlines, um, but also uh, celebrities, and then some familiar names to this audience, I would think, in that they're traditional protein producers who also are investing. And according to the Good Food Institute, which is basically a, 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 um, a lobbying group, I guess, who are laser focused on using markets and food technology to transform our food system away from factory farmed animal products and towards clean meat and plant based alternatives, they suggest that these um, companies are, are ready to flourish in the post uh, COVID-19 area and there's been about $741 million raised in the first quarter of 2020 which nearly matched all of what was raised in, in 2019 and you can see some of the big um, venture um, bets there. And I think that they're coming in because according to this AT Kearney report um, which suggests that by 2040 as I said, that only 40% of conventional will be meat will be produced by conventional meat. And here's a chicken leg. They suggest that perhaps 25% will be the plant-based burgers and 35% will be cultured meat. And I think that's a pretty, pretty big number. Um, but there's actually a way you can kind of get an estimate on what are we talking about here because the FAO has estimates of, of how much um, meat we're likely to be producing in 2040 and it's kind of shown on this slide here. This is FAO data and we're estimated to produce 1,751 million metric tons of animal source proteins in 2040. By far the majority milk and then of course fish is the largest meat category. But I'm going to give the, the um, 
estimate the benefit of the doubt and suggest that they were just talking about replacing terrestrial meat, that is cattle, pigs and chickens, um, with these alternative source proteins by 2050. So what that suggests is that by 2050, um, 402 million metric tons of terrestrial meat will be produced, of which 60% will come from alternative protein sources. Just to give you a feel for the numbers involved in that, I did a kind of a back of the envelope calculation and said if we're going to have 35% will be vegan meat replacements and uh, sorry, 35% will be cultured meat and 25% will be um, vegan meat replacements. Then you do the math and 25% of 402 million metric tons and then you times that by quarter pounders because that's basically the metric of, of this um, discussion. That will require somewhere around about 886 billion quarter pounders annually to be 25% uh, of global meat production. And the 35% is going to be somewhere over 1 trillion uh, in vitro burgers are need to be produced in 20 years time. And just to kind of put that in context, there's not a single burger produced using cultured meat at the current time. There's nothing on the market. Um, whereas here we do have some plant-based burgers that are being sold. Um, so that's a pretty big ask. So let's have a look at what data there is out there to ask if um, there's an evidence base for the assessment of end product improvement. And so basically I've got attributes listed here and this just kind of puts things in perspective. So we produce about 105 billion pounds of meat annually in the US and that's about 99.8% by volume of meat that's produced. The vegan meat replacements at the current time produce about 200 million pounds per year or about 0.2% of the supply. And cultured meat, as I said, has produced nothing to date. And so because there's nothing on the market, it's really hard to get an estimate of the nutritional attributes, the price, the taste or the sustainability metrics. So this is all kind of a big question mark. But there is some product on the market here. So we can compare nutrition and price. Taste, I feel, is kind of a personal preference thing. I find it hard to have an objective measurement there. So I'm just going to leave that to personal preference. And then the sustainability metrics, we absolutely can have a look at the data on that. And so that's what I'd like to do. I will just spend a little time on cultured meat, even though there's nothing in the market, because you hear so much about it. And basically, as I mentioned, that living cells are introduced into a bioreactor, which has to be provided with nutrients in a suitable growth medium containing food grade components that has to be effective and efficient in supporting and promoting muscle cell growth. And I actually grow cells in my own molecular lab. Um, and you, the growth medium typically contains things including um, products derived from fetal bovine and horses that will have to not be present in these um, basically vegan or the, in these in these products that are trying to um, replace animal f source foods, and typically we raise ours with antibiotics because it's really hard to keep these cultures um, free of of all microbes, and so it's not going to be easy to get effectively a defined medium that will grow animal cells in culture, and that's what the companies are working towards. And additionally, you need to basically add a whole bunch of um, nutrients in order to match or exceed the nutritional value of conventional meat products. And typically, these meat pro these um, nutrients are going to be added in from fermentation or culture, but they're going to have to have the essential amino acids, vitamin B12, iron, micronutrients, and all of the um, basically nutrition that comes from a, from a typical meat product. And so it's not going to be trivial to do that. Last year, the first company started to build the first lab-grown meat production facility. This is in Jerusalem, and it's called Future, Future Meat Technologies. And it's going to establish the world's first cultured meat pilot production facility, producing GMO-free meat. <laughs> you know that really excited me to see them uh, using that term, cultivated directly from animal cells on a commercial scale. And that's kind of an interesting statement because if they're going GMO-free, that's going to make it really hard for them to source those ingredients that would be otherwise produced in recombinant microbes like soy hemoglobin or B12 um, to introduce the same nutrient profile as meats. 
and they plan to establish the facility um, and they basically have started their development efforts due to $14 million secured in, in Series uh, A funding. And the company says that its laboratory-based manufacturing model results in 99% less land use and 80% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than traditionally produced meat. I'm not sure where they got those numbers from, given they haven't actually produced anything, and so it's hard to do a life cycle analysis. You have to basically anticipate all of those numbers, um, and that it plans to introduce hybrid products into the market, combining plant proteins for texture with cultured fats to create the aroma and flavor of meat. And I think that's a really interesting thing. What they're suggesting here is they're going to use plant fillers and then some of the product will be basically this cultured meat. And at the moment, the existing costs are 150 per pound for chicken and 200 per pound for beef. Um, but with this hybrid product, they hope it to get to a competitive cost level by 2021. Um, and that's uh, going to be interesting to see if they're able to accomplish this. They plan to basically double um, the fibroblast cells in mass every 24 hours and produce cell-grown chicken, lamb and beef in only two weeks. Um, I, I think that's a big ask. It, it's a, basically funded by a bunch of venture capitalists and with this investment we're thrilled to bring cultured meat from the lab to the factory floor and to begin working with our industrial partners to bring our product to market. And I find it a bit ironic that um, some of the things that are used to criticize animal ags, factory farms and industrial agriculture is actually the definition of what we're talking about here because we are actually talking about producing food in a factory um, and so it's interesting how that's uh, not not seen as a negative in this particular case. So this all started because in 2013 there was a Dutch professor who unveiled, unveiled the world's first slaughter-free hamburger which was basically cultured in a lab for a cost of around about 335 US thousand US dollars um, and that effort was funded by Sergi Brin who was the co-founder of Google um, and at the time the, uh, Mark Post who's a professor um, and who still argues that to date there's no process for proliferating not just muscle cells but also fat cells which are particularly relevant for taste and it's also not yet possible to produce larger pieces of meat such as steaks using in vitro culture and I guess I, I would beg to differ. I think we do actually have a method for producing such products. And basically the bioreactor that we use to do that is called a rumen. Um, and it's basically a self-propelling, self-cleaning, solar-powered, cellulose-driven bioreactor that has the ability to produce highly nutritious animal source foods. But the byproduct is methane as a result of digesting this otherwise undigestible cellulose to produce that product. And um, I think that it's going to be hard to compete against this biologically driven system. According to another report from the Rethink X, the fermentation farms are going to be the new farms, that's the cell culture farms, and that by 2030, so they're upping the game and saying in 10 years time, 70% of all beef consumed will come from modern production methods. By that they mean not cows, I'm assuming. So I'm a bit of a scientist and I looked at the graph they had in their report. So 70% by 2030, oh, so I drew a line and it's like they didn't even get that right. <laughs> um, but I do know, I'm sitting in 2020, so I do know what 2019 looked like and according to them in 2019, 10% of beef is being produced from modern methods. And so is that actually true? No, it's not. 10% of meat production is not coming from alternative meat sources. Nothing's coming from in vitro. And in the United States, we produce more than 105 billion pounds of animal meat each year. And the best estimates of US plant-based meat production hovers around 200 million pounds per year, which is about 0.2% of total meat volume or about 1% of value. Um, and so it, it kind of frustrates me that they can't even get that right when the data is actually there to, to evaluate it. So now let's switch gears and talk about these plant-based burgers. So we've gone from in vitro to plant-based, so the beyond and impossible. And although they get a lot of the action, there's actually quite a few 
brands of these meat alternatives and by far the biggest market share belongs to Morningstar Farms which has been around for a long time um, and basically these these are veggie burgers um, so here's Beyond which is um, in this grey bar here you hear a lot about Beyond but there have been a lot of players on the market for quite a long time um, and I think that it's important to, to realize that, that this this market share has been around um, and since COVID there's been a real kind of amplification of the the plant-based meat um, increase in sales and I saw this from the Good Food um, Institute saying that the plant-based meat dollar sales growth has consistently outperformed animal-based meat dollar sales growth and so here's COVID in the US starting back in March and you can see that there was this huge jump um, as everybody basically started hoarding toilet paper and the like and it went up to 158 percent and on average it's been at about 86 percent increase relative to the 45 percent that the beef and, and animal-based um, meat dollar sales growth has increased and you might think whoa that bodes really badly but I think it's really important to keep things in perspective so just remember that plant-based meat is about 200 million pounds a year and animal-based meat is about 105,000 or 105 billion tons so when we're talking about increases like this when we're talking the plant-based increase is about a hundred million pound uh, dollars of, of of intake that's a five thousand million dollar increase or five billion dollar increase in animal based sales and so a, a, a proportional increase of a small thing is easier to achieve than a proportional increase of a large thing and these are stunning in proportional increases in animal based um, food that's been purchased and US ground beef sales have been up a billion dollars in 2020 and year to date through May 17 the meat department dollar sales were up um, about 24.8 percent and that reflects an additional 5.5 billion dollars sold versus the same period last year um, and similarly um, in terms of total amount produced it's about a 7.6 billion pound increase so um, the the meat department's been doing pretty well during this COVID thing as well in fact it's been doing so well that it's actually cut in a little bit to the plant-based share of the total meat category and we can see that that's gone down a little bit just because um, there's been so much absolute sales of meat in the nine week period ending May, May 10th and so um, that's basically what's been going on in COVID. So are there data available to make an evidence-based assessment of end product improvement? Let's have a look at price and really there's only two products that I'm going to talk about here and that's the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger and this is kind of an interesting breakdown of these two products. So the Beyond Burger is made of basically peas and it includes um, a lot of um, coconut uh, butter and oil to give it the white flex but they made an interesting discover or decision to be non-GMO and so they're labeled non-GMO which basically means that they can't add a lot of the nutrients that you would normally expect to see in in meat products and that has a real impact on its nutri nutritional profile Impossible Burger shown here is made up mostly of soy so both legumes peas and soy they also have coconut oil and then they've added things like soy leg hemoglobin that's produced in genetically engineered bacteria and things like vitamin B12 um, that are produced in um, recombinant uh, organisms also so they've they haven't tied their hands by saying I'm not going to use technology um, I'm going to use technology and I'm going to produce a product that's nutritionally as similar to beef as I can and in general these products are more expensive this was just the value when I or the price when I googled it uh, on my computer because I can't go to the grocery store um, and basically you know on a per ounce basis depending beefs somewhere around about four to eight depending if it's you know grass fed or wagyu or, or just conventional beef so on average they're two to three times more expensive than beef products on a price um, basis and that's kind of the 
the data that's out there um, and then are there data available to make an evidence-based assessment of end product improvements as it relates to nutrition and this is a breakdown of the nutritional attributes of the Beyond Burger, the Impossible Burger and the Beef Burger um, and so the Beyond and Impossible are in green here and then beef is shown in this um, brown color and then you can see protein um, is pretty similar between the three of them and then kind of depending what what nutritional attribute you're interested in um, there's differences and similarities um, so they have similar amounts of fat similar amounts of saturated fat only the beef burger has cholesterol which might be a bad thing for some people only these plant-based burgers have carb carbohydrate there's no dietary fiber in beef burger. Um, I'm not sure I normally eat a burger for dietary fiber. There is some in the plants. But there's a whole bunch of nutrients where we really just don't know. So that's where if I don't have the answer to this, I, I can't really respond. But I kind of highlighted in, in um, red ones that I think are quite different. So there's quite a bit of salt or sodium in the, the plant-based burgers compared to a conventional burger. And then interestingly, when we look at vitamins um, and particularly ones that um, we're, we're interested in like B12 it's just not listed on the Beyond Burger but given that they're not allowed to use um, GMO ingredients I'm guessing that they're probably not there um, whereas the Impossible Burger um, has pretty analogous vitamin B12 to the to the beef burger um, and if you go along here for example it's got more folate um, which is important to, to pregnant women um, similar amounts of vitamin B6 and niacin and just a really uh, higher amounts of riboflavin a really 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 big amount of thiamine and perhaps you know one of the other important attributes you eat meat for is, is iron um, and they have higher levels of iron but it's not as bioavailable as iron that you might expect to see in a, in a, um, a beef burger. So that's kind of the the data on the nutritional attributes so some some good some bad fairly similar I would say um, overall uh, to the nutritional composition of a beef burger especially impossible burger which has the added nutrients that you would expect to see in a beef burger and so a lot of the rationale for eating these is the environmental implications and so let's have a look at what the data are in that regard and I'm going to cite from this paper by Hannah Tumesto um, that was published last year that does a really nice job of comparing these products on a kilogram of protein basis um, and so this is in this case the greenhouse gas emissions of different protein sources um, and we can look across here and we see the ruminants the monogastrics um, the products of monogastric or eggs and milk and then the meat substitutes are basically the the vegan burgers the impossible burger type thing cultured meat is growing the cells in culture and then insects and then pulses for those of you that aren't familiar with that term is basically a subset of the legumes that is the dry seeds um, and you can compare that to the, the soybeans and peanuts are also legumes but they um, have too much oil to be pulses and then spirulina is a type of um, algae and what you'll see is if you're really interested in decreasing your greenhouse gas emissions that these these three tend to come in low the whole way across insects pulses and spirulina there's a couple of truisms and that is in general animals have a higher carbon footprint than plants so that's not unexpected you're going up a trophic level and in general ruminants tend to have higher greenhouse gas emissions than monogastrics because they're eating cellulose or grass and the rumen is basically breaking down that indigestible cellulose and producing methane from the from the bugs in the rumen that's not the case in these ones but these guys of course the poultry the monogastrics have to be provided with feed that they can digest and that is going to be more directly competing with human food sources than these guys that are out on land that has no other human food purpose and so there's there's some nuances here but I think that in general it's fair to say that there's increased levels of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with a kilogram of ruminant protein. If we look at the land use um, 
not unexpectedly again we see the ruminants up here having high land use because they're using rangeland that has no other human food purpose and they need large amounts of um, forage to and large amounts of land to, to collect that forage so they're using a different land resource than necessarily pork or poultry are um, and I think it's interesting to note that this particular author who um, was one of the original um, authors of a of a cultured meat life cycle analysis which was very um, anticipatory because we really don't have anything growing so you kind of have to predict what what the um, life cycle might be she wrote in this paper that she did in 2019 a, almost a defense of livestock production because it's, a, it's livestock production especially extensive cattle grazing maintains various habitats and species and is therefore beneficial for biodiversity thus a complete elimination of livestock is not reasonable from the perspective of biodiversity and also argues that they're part of a sustainable agricultural system as they recycle nutrients and they utilize plants that humans cannot consume as food um, I was very surprised to read that in this in this paper but I think that um, it's good to see the recognition of the important ecosystem services provided by ruminants and then the final environmental impact that that this paper looks at is the energy use of different protein sources and here we see quite a different picture we see high levels for fish here because this is ocean caught fish and there's quite high energy use to go out and catch those fish in terms of running the motorboats out there but here we had to start to see actually higher levels for the meat substitutes and particularly the cultured meat again this is anticipatory but why would you have high energy levels? Well, basically you're replacing a biological system with industrial electricity or energy to keep that incubator warm and to basically do all the cleaning and all the rest of it that comes along with replacing the body of a cow with industrial inputs. And so that puts a bit of a different perspective. And I think it's important to look at in the US um, where are the sources and sinks of greenhouse gases and I think this is often um, overlooked in this whole discussion because if we look overall at the greenhouse gas emissions that are produced in the US in 2018 there was 6,677 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents but that never looks at the fact that there's quite a big sink coming from land like um, land use and forestry in other words ag and forestry is sucking in carbon dioxide and sequestering it and the vast majority of the greenhouse gases in fact 75 percent of US carbon dioxide emissions is from the combustion of fossil fuel and this sequestration of carbon dioxide by the land sector is actually greater it's 12 percent of greenhouse gas emissions than all of agriculture which is 10 percent of US greenhouse gas emissions and of that animal ag is four percent and so what happens if we replace the 10 percent of agriculture or specifically the four percent that is animal agriculture with products that are grown in a factory that are being powered by electricity what will be the trade-offs associated with replacing agriculture with industrial food production and I think that we really need to understand those metrics before we convert 70% of our beef production to alternative protein sources and I think I'm just going to finish with this kind of um, ironic slide that or ironic statement that's in one of these um, think tank reports who suggests that by 2030, so 10 years time, cattle, pasture, rangeland and feed cropland will decline by about 50%. This will disrupt the US beef and dairy industries by modern production methods and will free up about 300 million acres of land by 2030, rising to 450 million acres by 2035. I'm not sure what they mean by free up. Last I checked that land was privately held land. Um, but what I really found interesting was as they pondered what would happen to this land by 2030, this so-called free land, and they suggested maybe it could be um, rewilded. But they actually ended up suggesting, and I'm actually quoting them here, that the best proxy for land that has no alternative productive use might be ranch land. <laughs> 
Uh, the irony of that statement is perhaps not lost on this audience, um, but I guess on that point, I agree with them. <laughs> Um, and I think that uh, with that, I will finish and I hope to see you in the real world soon. Thank you, Dr. Van Hinnenen. We appreciate it. Great presentation as usual. Um, we, I noticed you answered questions that we went through, so we appreciate you doing that live. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I don't see any more t uh, pop up there. Uh, we've got two minutes left in our session, so I would like to kind of close out. Uh, by saying on behalf of the advancements and, and uh, in products uh, committee, we appreciate all the appreciate all the great questions. And if you have more questions, please should type those in the question answer box in the speakers. I'll ask them to stay on just a bit longer so they can get to those real quick and get those answered. Uh, thank you to the speakers. We appreciate it. It was a great uh, subcommittee. Uh, again, almost live webinar. We appreciate you being online and doing that. So with that, Bob Weber, I'm going to turn it over to you. And again, thanks to you and your team for making this happen. State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs>